Good morning. Got the toys for later. In just a minute. As we get started, I, Jared, I appreciate you going through uh, the prayer and praise items. Uh, there was one other that uh, as we just prepare our hearts and we think about uh, things that are going on. I was talking to uh, Ashley Zahn and uh, right before I was coming up here and I asked her when she was due and she said tomorrow. C-section, is that correct? All right. And uh, man, I can't even imagine what it's like to have a baby. All right, you're with me on that. Um, no, but adding another person to your family and knowing that you have that to look forward to uh, tomorrow for Chris and Ashley, uh, we are going to be in prayer for you as well. And uh, it also made me think of, uh, there are a lot of other things that we carry around with us that no one around you knows about. Isn't that right? There are things that, you've, that you're facing today that no one knows anything about. We, some of those are in the bulletin as we talk about the, the struggles or maybe the, the difficulties that we're facing. Others, others no one knows about. And uh, I, part of gathering together is, is to bring those here this morning. And uh, there's a reason why we have that cross here on our stage is because we want to continue to remind you that that's where we want to place those things, uh, giving them back to our Heavenly Father and allowing Him to carry those for us. So as I pray, I just invite you to talk to the Holy Spirit, uh, give those concerns, those praises to Him, and uh, pray with me as, as we go into our into our message this morning. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for a Savior. I need a Savior each and every day. And Heavenly Father, I, I thank you that whether we're here in this building or whether we're out and about throughout our community and the places that life takes us, that you go with us that when we have a relationship with you, your Holy Spirit lives with, within us, empowering us and using us in ways that we could never imagine on our own. Lord, life is, life is difficult. There are many situations that we're facing that, that bring us fear. And this morning, Lord, as, as we look into your word, we just ask that, that the life of Nehemiah, the things that we'll be studying, that you've given to us, Lord, Speak directly to our situations, to our needs. Remind us of who you are. Also, Lord, prepare us for, for the relationships, the inter encounters that we will have this week with those that are around us in our homes, at school, at, at our workplace. Thank you so much, Lord. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as you know, it is graduation Sunday. And uh, I, am, I am very, very proud of my son who's graduating uh, this afternoon. As of 3 o'clock, my wife and I will be empty nesters. Isn't it done then once they've all graduated out of your house? The responsibility's done. We've moved them along. So on Tuesday, we're heading to Spain for two weeks. We are leaving for, for Spain for two weeks to, to, to be with Cassidy. Uh, but as you know, graduation isn't just about things coming to an end. And while we might be coming empty nesters, we also know there's another term that is sometimes used around graduation time, and that's the word commencement. And uh, to commence means to start, which I always find interesting. And sometimes you'll, maybe even this afternoon, as you go to a graduation, it will be called the commencement ceremony. And it's that start of something new in our life. I was mentioning to those that are around me, I graduated from Hillsboro High School, right down the road. Any other Hillsboro graduates? Thank you. Look at that. Look at that. Man. Sorry to bring that up. Uh, let's focus again on God's Word. Um, I needed to leave Hillsboro, which I'll probably hear an amen in that. Uh, I needed a reboot in my life, to use a word perhaps that uh, the younger generation would know. I needed to start something new. For me, it was important to get out of Hillsboro. But as I went off to college, I also know and I also knew that there were things that I was going to at college as I was leaving that I could get involved in again as I left. 
And actually, what I've learned as I've gotten older was my parents for 18 years plus then had invested in me and were teaching me to be a parent to myself. The terms that we sometimes use is self-parenting. We learn how to take care of ourselves, how to make decisions. And the word that I'd like to define as we begin is this word sifting. Because sifting is one of the first things that you as graduates learned to do when you were just a kid, right? You, were, you learned how to sift, how to separate the large from the small and to scrutinize. And that's why I've, I've brought some of the, these uh, fun toys with me this morning uh, to our worship service because uh, actually I asked, I asked my father-in-law to see if he could find me a sifter and, and he got me this whole, this whole, what's it called? Beach bag sand play set that all came along. They have these in Kansas, even without beaches. It's pretty cool. And so uh, there was this beach bag play, uh, play set that he got me, but at the very top of it uh, is, is a sifter. And, and I believe that uh, as kids, we all had one of these, right? You, you have one of these not just at the beach, but also uh, in, your, uh, in your sandbox. And um, as, as we know, it's used to uh, separate those things that are, that are large from, from the small, to differentiate from one thing to another, and to scrutinize. And so uh, in, in my bucket here, in my, in my pail, uh, I have uh, the sand, and I have uh, some, some kernels of truth. Okay, some kernels of truth. So as I uh, pour out the sand from my bucket, and it goes hopefully into the other bucket. I'll have to let Tony know what I did. Um, uh, you can sift these things out, and you get rid of the excess, and uh, you're left with, I'm left with here, four, four stones. I got rid of the sand, and I was able to find the four stones that I had in the bottom. Now, it's not as big a deal to us, perhaps, anymore to, uh, to do the, the sifting. It doesn't perhaps affect our life as much as what it even used to, because now we have combines. In the old days, as, as you were having to try to harvest the wheat and separate the kernels from all the extra that went with a, a stalk of wheat, with a, uh, is it a stalk of wheat? It is now. Uh, with a stalk of wheat, uh, you, you wanted to just get, when you're making your bread, you just wanted that kernel that, that's there in the middle. Because if you have all that other stuff in it, your bread doesn't taste quite as good. And so they would pour uh, and they would throw the shaft and all of that up in the air and it would separate and, and uh, give you the part that you wanted, the part that you needed from the junk. And so uh, this morning, as we're looking into the life of Nehemiah, what I'd like to give you as graduates are four kernels of truth that come from uh, this chapter here in Nehemiah chapter 6. And so if you take your bulletins and uh, you can look there on the back side, we have an outline of, of where we'll be headed this morning. And turn in your Bibles to Nehemiah chapter 6. There's a Bible there in your row. We are on page 387. 387 in the Bibles that, there, that are there in your row. And so in Nehemiah chapter 6, let's look at verses 1 through 4. When the word came to Sambala, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, that I had rebuilt the wall, and not a gap was left in it, though up to that time I had not set the doors and the gates, Sambala and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent a messenger to them with this reply. I am carrying out a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Verse 4, but four times they sent me the same message. And each time I gave them the same answer. Do you remember who Sambala, Tobiah, Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of them were? They were not his friends. In fact, in verse 1 there, it says that they were his enemies. And yet, they reached out to Nehemiah and made it sound like, let's get together. Let's get together and talk about the things that were going on. Remember, these are the same guys who surrounded the town of, of Jerusalem. Now they were looking for the, the opportunity to surround and trap Nehemiah. 
The walls were up. The gaps had been closed. In fact, there was only one thing left. What was the one thing left to do on this city so that the walls would be completed? It said that the, that the gates hadn't been set yet. The gates still needed to be set. These guys said, we need to do something before the work is completed. And so they tried to pull him away from the others that were around him. But Nehemiah, he had discernment. And while Sanbala and Tobiah and Geshem wanted to lead him into temptation, to harm him, to hurt him, he had the discernment to say no. No, I know who these guys are. I know what they're up to. And he didn't need to just say no once, as we read there in verse 4. He said no to them four times. And how did he reply? He says there in verse 3, I'm carrying out a great project. I'm doing a great work and cannot go down. Graduates, there are going to be times when people want you to go and do something with them, and you're going to need to reply to them, I can't go. I'm doing a great, in your case, homework, right? I'm doing a great work. There's a great work that's going on. I don't need to be distracted. But whether you're a graduate or each one of us in the lives that we live, we know that there are times when people come to us and they try to distract us from the things that God is calling us to do. And so my question, not only for our graduates, but also for us as a church body is, do we have a vision? Do we have a work that God has called us to that when others say, this is what you should be about, and this is what you should be doing, that we're able to respond to them. No, God has called me to a great work, and I'm not going to be distracted from that. Think about that in your own life or in the life of this church. What are those things that God has called us to that no matter what others around us might want us to do, we can say, I know what God's called me to do, and I'm going to continue to follow after that with a passion. Be careful not to compromise and settle for less than God's best. He has the best for you. That's our first kernel. Our second kernel of truth, as we're looking for what God has for us as opposed to what the world has for us, comes from verses 5 through 9. Then the fifth time, so they, they had come to them four times. Verse 5 says, Now the fifth time Sambala sent his aid to me with the same message. And in his hand was an unsealed letter. Let's just stop there just for a moment. So he had sent this message four times. He sends the same message again, but this time it says that it wasn't just a message for him. It came in an unsealed letter. It was an open letter. This means that not only would Nehemiah be able to read this, but those who brought the message would hear about it, and those within the the city of Jerusalem and all around would hear it as well. So they changed their tactics a little bit. So why did they change their tactics? Look at verse 6. So, in his hand was written an unsealed letter in which was written this. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it is true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you are building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you are about to become the king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king. So so come, let us meet together. What did these guys add to the report that was sent this time? Intimidation. Fear. Fear. Here, the king had sent Nehemiah, Sambala, Geshem, and Tobiah, and the rest of the surrounding nations didn't like it that they were back there. And so in order to intimidate them, and again to stop the work, they started making fat, false accusations about him. That's what slander is all about. They started talking about him, saying that he is a traitor. Verse 8, I send him this reply. Nothing like what you are saying is happening. You are just making it up out of your head. So they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will be too weak for the work, and it will not be completed. Warren Wearsby says that fear destroys faith and paralyzes life. Fear paralyzes our lives. What are you afraid of? 
this morning? Is it keeping you from the work that God is calling you to accomplish? We look at the end of verse 9, we see that while they wanted to intimidate them, to stop the work, to keep them from the things that they were about, the end of verse 9 shows one of the responses that Nehemiah had. But he prayed, now strengthen my hands. That's a great verse to underline. If you're about underlining uh, verses in your Bible, I, I believe that's a great one to underline. When there was, when there was fear, when there was the opportunity to doubt the things that, that God was about, when there was the opportunity to compromise, when others were talking bad about him, Nehemiah prayed, shot up one of these, as we've talked about, one of these arrow prayers, and we just get a half a verse there where he says, God strengthened my hands. We face temptation. Graduates, you will face temptations. You will want to follow after those things that are around you, and he is with you. Your Heavenly Father is with you, and we can talk to him anytime. And Nehemiah shows this. He prays and talks to God and says, while everybody else might doubt my intentions, the things that I'm doing, strengthen me in the things that you've called me to do. He stood up to the temptation. The third opportunity that we have to go our own way and, and to sift through what is truth and what is what the world has for me comes in verses 10 through 13. And, and it's a it's a danger that is even closer to home for each and every one of us, and that's the idea of betrayal. What happens when someone that's close to us lets us down? Look at verse 10. One day I went to the house of Shemaniah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabelah, who was shut in, in his home. He said, that is Shemaniah, let us meet in the house of God inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors. Because men are coming to kill you. By night, they are coming to kill you. What was the tactic that this prophet had? The tactic that he had was he started out by going and hiding in his own home. Do you notice that? There in verse 10, it says that this prophet had, had shut himself away. He was hiding in his own home. And then he called to Nehemiah and said, come to my house. I need you to come to my house. And when he got there, he said, your life is in danger. I'm even hiding myself because I'm supposedly with you. I'm a prophet. So we're hiding ourselves. Let's go to the temple, and let's go in the temple and close the doors and keep ourselves safe. Let's go there and keep ourselves safe so that, so that you won't die. Here's a prophet, someone who was supposed to be declaring to others what God was saying for them, and yet he was lying to him. And look at verse 11. Nehemiah responds to him, Why should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. Nehemiah goes on and he says, I realized that God had not sent him, but that he had prophesied against me because Tobiah and Sambala had hired him. He had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Sanbala and Tobiah and Geshem, they said, well, if he won't listen to us, then maybe we'll get someone that's close to him. We'll pay off somebody that's close to him, and, and we'll get him to sin. You know, Nehemiah wasn't a, wasn't a priest. He wasn't allowed to go into the temple and do the things that he was being encouraged by the prophet to do. If he would have done that, not only was there the potential of death, but at the very least, his name would be discredited. Sometimes there are those that are around us who give us instruction that sound really good and per perhaps even use God's word to try to encourage us to do something that goes completely against what God has said. As we sift for truth, we also have to re be reminded that, that Satan is sneaky. He will send people and ideas that sound reasonable that may be even sound scriptural and try to deceive us. Another great example of this from who Satan is comes out of the book of, of Matthew chapter 4 when, when Satan took Jesus to the top of the temple. And, and Jesus had been in the wilderness and, and Satan was tempting him and 
One of the temptation comes in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 5. It says this, Then the devil took him to the holy city, that would be to Jerusalem, took him to the holy city and had Jesus stand at the highest point of the temple. Then Satan said, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. And then Satan quotes Psalm 91 to Jesus. Satan quotes Psalm 91. He says, He will command his angels concerning you, and they will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Here's Satan using God's word to try to get Jesus to do something that he shouldn't do. If Satan is doing that with Jesus, what is he doing with you and I? The exact same thing. Taking God's word, twisting it, and saying, you can trust that. We need to continue to search God's word and know his word. Not just parts of it. If all Jesus knew was Psalm 91, he would have been deceived. We need to know all of God's word. It's all of there for us. And especially as graduates come, let's see, the first Sunday in September, you might be wondering, what do I do this Sunday morning? Do I go to church or do I hit the snooze button? I've been there. We've been there. A lot of times we do a lot of this, right? Hitting that snooze button and going back to sleep. We need to continue to grow in our walk with Christ. We need to continue to stay in his word so that we know truth. Because not only will our enemies try to deceive us, also those that are close to us might try to deceive us as well. And it doesn't end there. We'll go on to the the fourth kernel of truth that comes out of these other friends or relationships that Nehemiah had. Look at verse 16. When all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. I skipped verse 15, and I shouldn't, so let me go back to there first. Verse 15 says, So the wall was completed on the 25th of Ehu in 52 days. So I skipped the, probably the most important part. The wall was done and only took 52 days to rebuild it and for the, for the gates to be set, etc., Verse 16, when all of our enemies heard this and all the surrounding nations were afraid and lost their self-confidence because they realized that this work had been done with the help of God. Verse 17, also in those days the nobles of Judah were sending many letters to Tobiah and replies from Tobiah kept coming to them. For many in Judah were under oath to him since he was the son-in-law to Shechaniah, son of Erha, and his son Jehonahana, had married the daughter of Meshulam, son of Berechiah. Verse 19, Moreover, they kept reporting to me his good deeds and telling him what I said. And Tobiah sent letters to intimidate me. So here's Nehemiah. He had stood up to the request to compromise. He had said, I'm not going to run when people slander me. He had also stayed there and, and not given in and, and been deceived and betrayed by the prophet. And yet it didn't end. The nobles continued to say good things about Tobiah, and they continued to, to try to persuade Nehemiah to stop the work that he was doing. I don't want to cause paranoia, but we need to continue to use caution. Sometimes those that are closest to us, friends, family, the church, we can all let each other down. Fear and discouragement can crop into our lives. And sometimes conflict is most difficult, and usually conflict is most difficult when it comes from within. If you have conflict in your house this morning, you know that. You know the discouragement and the fear that can be there. And yet we also know that God has said, I will strengthen your hands. I will provide for you. There's one last thing that I need to tell you, graduates, and then we'll wrap things up. And that is, you can know these four kernels of truth. You can know not to compromise. You can be careful to not give in to what other people have to say. We can stay in God's word. We can be careful of the friends that we have and and the direction that, that we lead us. But as your elders, as someone that's older than you, I can tell you that at some point, 
at some point, you're going to try to do all the right things, and you're going to fail. You're going to fail. You're going to fall right down, flat on your face, and the things that you want to do as you're sifting for truth, the things that perhaps your parents have taught you along the way, you're not going to make the right choice. We've been there. We've done that. And so the other thing that I need to give you before I let you go this morning is a reminder that even when you fall short, even when you choose something other than God's truth, I want to remind you that, that God will not abandon you. He is always there, and like Nehemiah, we can always go to him in prayer. Even at your lowest point, he is there, he hears you, he knows you. And when we fail, when we fall short of that, we need to continue to learn what it means to embrace God's grace. Because I need God's grace today. I need God's grace today. You need God's grace today. Satan is a liar. We know that. He doesn't just lie once to you. He'll lie more than once. But in a given sin and a given temptation, this is what he tends to do. The first thing he does is say, you can't trust God. I know this is what you've been taught in your home or in, in church. I know that's what you, you've been taught, but you don't need to listen to that. I have a better way for you. Satan lies to us and tells us that. He leads us down that road of temptation, and then of our own accord, we sin. But this is just how sneaky and decept deceptive that Satan can be. Not only does he lie to us before he sin, before we sin, he also lies to us after we sin as well. So don't be surprised. Don't be surprised that he'll lie to you and tell you this is good, go and do it. But after you do it and you face the consequences that sin has... He's also going to lie to you again. He's going to come to you and say, because you've sinned, now God doesn't lo love you anymore. And unless you start being good, he's not going to love you. That's called legalism. That God can only love you if you do good things. But that's not what God's word says. His word says that when we fall down, he's right there with us. He doesn't leave us or forsake us. He walks with us. And so when graduates, you fail... When you act like your parents, sorry Carson, but when you act like your parents and you fail from time to time, just also be reminded that God isn't going to leave you. He will not forsake you. His grace is with you each and every day and that he wants to define you. Jesus wants to define you. And that's one of the reasons why we have those, if you, as you walk through the, uh, the foyer as you leave, there's those, uh, those yellow sheets on, the, on that table back there on the way out, just talking about who Jesus says you are. Who does God say that you are? Let him define you. When we fall short, Satan comes along accusing us of being a failure. And Jesus steps in on your behalf as a follower of, of his and says, no, I know him. He follows after me. I died for him. I'll leave you with this verse out of Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Heavenly Father, each and every day, I need a Savior. Each and every day, Lord, you know that I fall short of what you've called me to be. And yet, Lord, I thank you so much for your grace. I thank you for your patience and that you continue to work with us. Thank you for these graduates. Thank you for the things that they've been able to learn in the homes uh, that they've grown up in. And Lord, each and every one of them, each and every one of us, has an opportunity, Lord, to, to sift through the things that, that our world are, is telling us. Sift through those things, those temptations, those distractions that come along. And Heavenly Father, you, you, you walk with us and you provide for us. And so we also thank you, Lord, for the forgiveness that's found in you. Thank you, Lord, that when we fall down, uh, you pick us up, you don't bail on us, you provide for us. Thank you for being our Savior. We ask this all in Jesus' name, amen.